Astronomy Association. Um, we're delighted to have you at our uh, first Friday, December meeting. We meet the first Friday of every month. And, um, and we're welcoming Facebook people um, so who are joining us. And we have Jim Knoll, who's working with the technology, and he will be helping Facebook people as well as our members. And we have our members on Zoom. We'll ask for our members to um, please stay uh, muted during the presentation. And um, if you're going to be moving around in a way that might be distracting, then you might want to turn off your, your video during that period of time. Um, we will ask for you to enter your questions on the presentation in the chat, and we will make sure then and address all the questions that come in from Facebook and from members. Um, so um, we um, tonight are going to have um, a presentation, and then after the presentation for our members, we will have some breakout rooms as well. Um, tonight, we have Kai Stotts, um, who is from the Biosphere, and uh, who is going to give us a wonderful presentation on Mars habitat. So Kai, are you ready to screen share? Sorry, I had to approve the recording. I just got back to work. Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so just a moment. Uh, thank you for uh, for welcoming me. I'm, uh, as you know, I just had to restart my computer. So bear with me. I'm just getting everything up and running again. Um, oh, that's so give fine. Me just, a, just a second and I'll be up and running here. Uh, let's see. Two. That is no problem for that. For everyone, please remember that we will post um, the recording of tonight's presentation both on, on Facebook and on YouTube. And so you'll be able to access that um, later and, and see the speaker presentation again if you'd like to, or share it with your friends if you would like to do that. Um, we're always delighted um, for you to share the information that TAAA has. And we post a lot of, of information specifically on the website, hoping that people will want to learn more about astronomy from our website and will take advantage of that opportunity. Okay, thank you for stalling for me. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is... Uh... I, I've, uh, I, I thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, again, my name is Kai Stotts, and I'm a researcher at the University of Arizona uh, Biosphere 2. And uh, this is a true honor I, it, for, for many, many, many ways, um, in part because I've only relatively recently in my life and my career come back to Arizona, um, but this is the state in which um, my, my passion for astronomy was rekindled uh, while I was in high school. Um, and then in college, and as I'll show you in one of the opening slides of my talk, um, I've known David for David Levy for a long, long time, and, and David and Wendy both, um, and we our paths have intersected multiple times over the last uh, number of years. So I'm uh, I've been a member of this club for over a year now, a year and a half, I think. Um, but sadly, I've not been able to attend any of the meetings. It just hasn't been the right timing. So here I am in my first actual official attendance, and and I'm presenting. So thank you for trusting that I might actually have something interesting to say. Um, tonight's presentation is about uh, as we become an interplanetary species, what are some of the things that we will need to live off of this planet in, in other uh, hostile environments? And the work that we're doing at the Biosphere 2, which is known principally for plant ecology studies, and of course, for the history of that audacious experiment back in the early 90s with eight people sealed inside for two years. Um, but we're doing a lot of really cool new stuff. Um, so at the end of this presentation, everyone is welcome, um, of course, to come up. Maybe we could even do an official uh, TA uh, tour, a behind the scenes tour for whoever would like to join. So, um, so with that, I'm going to, I'm going to dive in. I won't spend any time on, on my background or, or my history. I've had kind of a varied career and I'm just really pleased and proud to be where I am now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then get going. Okay. So let me see if 
Okay, let me find a way of reducing this. Uh, controls. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Affirmative. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see you now since I'm on the screen. So, um, so the uh, the title is constructing a Mars habitat at Biosphere Two, and uh, and uh, my, again, I'm Kai Stotts, the director of research at SAM at the Biosphere Two. SAM is a space analog for the Moon and Mars. You might be asking why there aren't two M's or at least an M squared, and it's simply because I got tired of writing two M's or M squared, so we just call it SAM. Um, it's difficult to pronounce if there's two M's, uh, so you can just say space analog for Mars if we want to make it simple. And so I want to start with this wonderful photograph, David. There you are, um, David. What year was this? What year was it that the uh, the comet crashed into Jupiter? Nineteen ninety four. Ninety four. Okay. So um, so this is uh, this is a long time ago. Um, this was uh, Dan High, my physics professor from Brophy in the background. Pete, one of our um, uh, uh, one of the. Uh, uh, the members of the Phoenix Astronomical Society for which I was president at this time or just slightly before. And of course, Gene Shoemaker was involved in this club uh, many, many years ago. So I don't even know where we took this photograph, David. It must have been just shortly after your presentation. What I do remember is that you walked in and you often introduced your talks uh, by starting with your cat. You would talk about your cat and then you'd move into uh, the presentation. And I think you had something completely different scheduled for that evening, as I had invited you once or twice a year to come and talk to our club. And you walked in and we all knew about the, the comet that you and, and Jean and, and uh, had discovered. And I think you walked in and said something like, well, as you can imagine, we're going to be talking about something different tonight. And everyone cheered. And so I, I remember that night vividly in my memory. So thank you again for, uh, for it's, it's wonderful to reconnect with you. So what we're talking about tonight is, is ultimately going towards something like this. This is a, a rendering, computer rendering by my good friend, Brian Vierstig, uh, just a, a fantastic space artist. And uh, he's got a plethora of, of, of kind of visionary uh, uh, examples of how we might live someday off of this world at uh, spacehabs.com. But if any of you have any background in this type of science fiction, because it is still science fiction at this point, even if intermixed with a lot of science fact, you'll know that there's a number of things wrong with this picture, uh, just as there are with any good movie. Um, there are challenges that are, we have not yet surpassed um, in, in terms of the physics of radiation and the, uh, and, and the amount of light, for instance, the amount of light fall on Mars is typically thought to be not enough to grow most food cultivars. Um, although there's some current research that says that's not true and we'll be doing just fine. But it does give us a sense of how we might live in some respects on the surface of Mars if we're not living in caves and lava tubes. And so I like this image because it paints a picture not of three or 400 years from now and definitely not five years from now, but maybe something in 15, 20, 25 years uh, if, if everything goes well and we're able to expedite our, our movement towards other planets. But central to this is something that is really important. If we're not just sending rovers and we're sending humans, then we have to be concerned with these vital functions of life support systems, of the uh, of all the functions that keep us alive. And that's not just comes in, but also what goes out. So you'll find that in discussion of human space travel, there's a lot of discussion of, of pee and poo, of urine and feces. That's kind of just standard vernacular. Um, and so that's going to come up repeatedly throughout this, this presentation. You just kind of have to get used to it. But you'll see even in this basic diagram that we do our absolute best to recycle everything. CO2 is removed and vented overboard, or in the case of our facility where you have plants, the CO2, of course, is fed to the plants, and the plants produce oxygen. Um, but you're really trying to recycle and recapture and reuse everything because there is no away in throwing it away and resupply is very very expensive and takes a long time anywhere you know, from several months so central to this uh, if we go all the way back to 1991 was the biosphere 2 the biosphere 2 um, was just as i said before an audacious experiment absolutely incredible experiment nothing like it has been done since um, there's an echo okay so this is 3.1 acres of a solid, solid stainless steel. steel. Kay, if you can put your microphone on me. Yeah, thank you. 
So there's 3.1 acres of a sealed structure, hermetically sealed structure, completely pressurized and fully sealed from the outside. When it was operational as a sealed facility, it had a lower leak rate than the International Space Station does today. It was an absolute engineering marvel. And again, there were eight people who lived inside from 1991 to 1993. And unfortunately, the media continues to play up some of the social challenges um, of, that, of that, but that's part of the experiment. And, and yes, they did have to pump oxygen in, in, uh, within about the first six or eight months, if I remember right. And that is not, a, I want you, you people of, of everyone probably understand this more than many of the audiences I speak to. That's not a failure. A failure is if you don't do the science at all, or if you don't learn from the scientific experiment, that's part of the experiment. Now, they did fail in terms of how they publicized it, how they managed that, but we now know that concrete curing and the microbial activity of rich soil are both counterproductive to the oxygen production and the CO2 required for the plants. So there's lessons learned. You would certainly want to learn here on Earth where you have the opportunity to bring oxygen as compared to on Mars where everyone would have died. Um, so this was a really valuable experiment. And if you go to Google Scholar, for instance, there are dozens of really solid publications, even new ones that are coming out even today from the Biospherians. Um, all of the, bio, there's six Biospherians of the original Biosphere crew left, and they are prolific in their uh, teaching engagements. All of them have their PhDs. They travel around the world um, and are doing fantastic continued work in ecology, human space studies. Um, even uh, if you've heard of space perspective and worldview, um, those were both founded by Jane and Tabor. From the original crew. So out of that, now, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, um, Gene Shoemaker, who many of us knew, Gene um, was the uh, planetary geologist who invited, and if I understand correctly, really helped build the analog astronaut training program for the Apollo mission at Meteor Crater, Arizona. So in the upper left-hand corner is a picture from the 60s in which the astronauts were brought to Northern Arizona. That was an analog. That was an experiment in which, or an environment in which astronauts could train in a similar terrain to what they might experience on the moon. Um, and they did so with and without full spacesuits. But then there's a, a, a prolific generation, just really in the last 10 or 15 years of analogs all over the world. So in the upper right-hand corner, we've got um, the, uh, the neutral buoyancy lab at NASA Johnson Space Center. And all the astronauts train in this for any sort of uh, EVAs and, and, uh, and spacewalks. In the center, we have high seas in Hawaii. Um, there's uh, Hera in the bottom left-hand corner, also at NASA Johnson Space Center. In the center bottom um, is the uh, Lunar Palace One, which is run by Beijing University. That was, again, a fully sealed, fully hermetically sealed bioregenerative study like uh, Biosphere 2, but much, much smaller and much more modern, where Biosphere 2 had a traditional um, soil-based farm Lunar Palace has entirely hydroponics, fully robotically controlled. Um, and they did a study, I think, of up to eight months with four people sealed inside. And on the bottom right -hand corner, the most specific of the current analogs, Mars Desert Research Station run by the Mars Society um, outside of Hanksville, Utah. And I was a member of a crew there in 2014, which is really what set me on this journey of wanting to build my own analog. So here's a brief list of the, the analogs that are currently in function today. There's actually a new one in addition to DMARS in Israel that just came online. There's a couple articles about it. Um, so there's, there's quite yeah, a few. Out. That's why. Um, sorry, I think someone needs to mute audio. Hey, would uh, you please mute? Yeah. Okay, so back in 1987, um, this, this structure is called the test module. This is on site at Biosphere 2. But the test module was built three years prior or four years prior to the completion of Biosphere 2 proper. This is a 400 square foot facility, um, including the lung, which is a pressure regulation system. There's 11,000 cubic feet. And this was a, a test bed. So there's a solid stainless steel floor, just like the biosphere. Um, there's uh, hermetically sealed windows, just like the biosphere. Use the same geometries inspired um, uh, by by, by uh, the, the, the geodesic domes by Buckminster Fuller, um, who was actually part of the initial the initial part of the project. And as you can see here, the Biospherians, who eventually moved in the biosphere, took turns living inside of this structure for up to three weeks at a time. Linda Lay, who lives in Oracle, Arizona, was one of the original Biosphere eight, and she stayed inside here for three weeks. All of her water, all of her air, all of her food, all of her human waste, fully recycled in that small space. Um, so this is the cornerstone, the foundation for the Mars analog we're now building. 
So I was at Biosphere 2 in 2019 doing a plant ecology study when I was when I was at Arizona State University and came across this building. It didn't look anything like this. It had been completely overrun by the desert. And for those of you who live uh, lived in the desert for a while, you know that any buildings left open will be inhabited very quickly by by creatures um, of the day and night. And so we um, we were granted an opportunity to refurbish this facility. And uh, here's how it looked 33 years later. And this is actually already after the um, this is after the uh, the landscaping crew came through and got rid of, of a lot of, of trees and plants, everything had grown up. So my associate Trent Tresh and I started on January 22nd of this year. It feels like years ago. And this was our very first 10 minutes and the very first effort to refurbish this facility um, in an effort to build a, uh, a Mars analog. So I'm gonna take you through just a few photographs, um, a photo essay uh, per se, and to, uh, to show you the, um, all, the, all the things that we've done in, in, in the concert of, of getting this up and running again. I'm gonna pause for just a moment and ask, is my voice clear and, and is it coming through okay? Um, it's usually clear, but sometimes it, we get some flickering. Okay, I'm gonna turn my video off, which I forgot to do earlier. Thank you for, for that. Um, the reason I'm asking is because I'm, I'm out in the middle of the wilderness in Cascabel and, uh, and I have very limited uploads. So thank you for reminding me. I turned my video off. That should help. Excuse me. Yes. I, I yes. really think you're talking too fast. The audio is coming through, at least to me, is getting garbled a lot. Okay. Thank you for that. So this is the... Um, I have a lot of energy, so I, I tend to speak fast. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we get this thing done. Um, so this is, I'm gonna take you on a photo essay of, um, of, of a number of the, of the efforts that have been conducted uh, in, in refurbishing this test module. So clearly it's a very uh, dusty, dirty environment when we, when we first got there. And uh, it has a space frame just like the Biosphere 2. And we had to repeatedly clean that space frame and get it functional again. Uh, one of the endeavors was to lower a 3,000 pound heat exchanger. Uh, that was the original heat exchanger for heating and cooling. And we've replaced that with just about 200 pounds of mini splits. So in that 33 years, there's been a vast improvement in the efficiency and mass required to heat and cool a space, which is very much welcomed. Um, so this is, I think, two or three weeks into our endeavor, uh, sanding and scraping. And uh, then in an effort to more closely approximate the, uh, the solar gain on Mars, we painted all of the top facing, any upward facing glass panels with silicone. And so this is a silicone that reduces optical transmission to about 92%, and UV um, is 100% blocked, and infrared almost 100% blocked as well, about 99. And although we cannot bury this structure underground for its given uh, design and, of course, cost, we've approximated the amount of light inside if you were on Mars by both coating the top surfaces and then uh, actually tinting the windows so that we have 50% optical transmission on all horizontal facing windows. And here is the effort to, uh, in the bottom right corner, to apply the window film. So when you're inside this module, you are seeing the quantity of light uh, or the, 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 uh, the intensity of light as you would on Mars. We had volunteers, about a dozen volunteers, even during COVID of earlier this year, they came in from all over the United States um, and from Peru and from the Navajo Nation. We were very careful and very successful in, uh, in having those volunteers work with us. We also conducted a full pressure test of a fully functional spacesuit, and we now own two suits. This is an older model. Our new models are just beautiful. All of the residents, the uh, attending research teams that use our facility will be able to go on EVAs in a fully pressurized spacesuit with an umbilical or a Mars cart. And uh, for if, if any of you have ever worn an actual pressure spacesuit, it is quite the endeavor. It's about 45 minutes to an hour to put it on. Um, and once you're inside, your movement is limited, even at just one or one and a half PSI over ambient, which this suit is inflated to at this time. Uh, but it's quite the experience. It's a really, really valuable experience to show you what it would be like to explore another planet in a pressure suit. And here's uh, the deputy director, John Adams. Um, of the Biosphere 2. Uh, he's the one who wore the suit for this day, and uh, he had a lot of fun. He, again, he said it was just a fantastic experience. 
So again, a few more uh, photographs, our new mini split coolers, um, our, our inflation system for pressurizing the module, patching some of the old stuff that had been eaten through by the rats and delivery of our first uh, shipping container, which will be the crew quarters. So I'll get into the function of the lung a little bit later, but we have an automated pressure regulation system called the lung. And the lung is a basically gravity uh, pressure module that, that um, is part of the pressure vessel. And the mass of the lung is floating on a cushion of air that is held within the pressure vessel. And the membrane, the rubber membrane is what uh, maintains the seal between that floating uh, pan and the outside of the pressure vessel. And I'll show you some pictures later. Oh, here we go. Here's one of them. So this is a, a 3,800 kilogram uh, pan floating on a cushion of air induced by a one half horsepower motor. It's absolutely breathtaking to watch it work. It's, it's physics at play. So again, just a summary of the um, a summary of the uh, some of the volunteer efforts and the folks who attended and assisted with us. We, we couldn't have done it without them. It was just a fantastic endeavor. And this is a picture taken in June. Um, I think late May or June of, uh, of, 2000, of 2021 of this year, when we were wrapping up the, uh, the volunteer efforts and the refurbishing of this structure. And this is an, a re an artist rendering of how this will appear. This is an older rendering. We have some newer ones that I haven't put into the slide deck yet, um, but this is an approximation of how we will attach the shipping containers. We won't actually be burying the shipping containers quite that deep, but we will be pushing some rocks up against and an artist rendering of the inside, again, not fully uh, built out for proper food production, but just one, one set of hydroponics. And this is an early concept for how we might build the, um, the crew quarters out of the shipping containers. We've actually reduced this by uh, about 50%. It will be smaller to begin with. We'll be adding on to it. We're partnering with uh, one or two significant aerospace companies who will be delivering uh, inflatables. So we're hoping to expand this, not with more rigid structures, but with inflatable habitats, which will be really exciting. And next to Sam is one of the original greenhouses that was used to harbor the plants that were eventually placed inside the biosphere too. So the biospherians traveled all over the world for years collecting plants, even on a sailing ship that they built themselves and they were housed inside of this. We're retaining this structure and rebuilding the roof and then creating inside of it a synthetic Mars crater. That Mars crater will be about 6,400 square feet um, composed of sculpted concrete and of course rebar underneath. And it'll be anywhere from, from uh, from one to three meters high, including a lava tube um, and a gravity offset rig. It's going to be fabulous. So when you exit the airlock, as you can see, when you exit the airlock from our habitat, you will feel like you are in Mars. You will be surrounded by Mars-like environments, which is really exciting for us. Uh, we're still raising the money to, it's, it's a quite an endeavor, um, but we're hoping to get the first effort done um, in, in the, towards the end of December, first part of January. And so again, just some other um, examples uh, of, of um, the, the like for instance, the gravity offset rig here. This is one that NASA used a long time ago. We're doing a little bit different. We're not going to require people to be horizontal, but we will be simulating reduced gravity for people who are in a harness. Um, and we're also building a miniature, a tiny little neutral buoyancy lab. We happen to have uh, had on campus a small aquarium from the original botanical garden that was adjacent to the biosphere. And we're refurbishing that aquarium. It's large enough for uh, two scuba instructors and one person in a spacesuit. So some of our team members that come through will actually be able to use a spacesuit underwater to simulate um, basically microgravity. Um, I'm not going to talk extensively about this. This is typically its own presentation. Uh, this is the interface to CMOC, and CMOC is how this whole thing started. It's a, uh, a research grade computer model that has an educational web interface that my team designed and built from 2017 forward. We still maintain this. It's funded and hosted by National Geographic and is available for free on the National Geographic website to citizen scientists all over the world. And what it allows you to do, and again, this is usually a whole presentation in and of itself, it allows you to design your Mars habitat. You choose the plants, the number of astronauts, the CO2 scrubbers, the solar panels, everything. And then you set the model in motion. This is built off of authentic NASA data, 40 years of NASA data incorporated into an agent-based model uh, with, built on Python with the JavaScript interface. 
And we're now uh, just about six weeks away from launching a whole new version that's, that's greatly improved, uh, taking even way beyond this. So the reason I bring this up is that, one, I'd love to have you try it, um, but two is because this interface is now being integrated into our Mars analog by a university of, I'm sorry, an Arizona State University computer science team. So we have a capstone team, five students who are building a new backend server so we can do live data feeds from our Mars analog and feed it directly into this interface on the National Geographic website. That will enable both our team members that are inside and people all over the world to do real-time monitoring of the CO2, the oxygen, the water vapor, the, uh, the nitrogen, the methane, and their plant production. It's, it's gonna be really, really cool. And something like that's never been done before. So we're really excited about that. Um, and finally, or not finally, but just, just a few um, bullet points. I won't read these to you, you're all capable of reading, um, but these are the basic stages of construction. We're now in stage two. Um, in which we are working on the crew quarters, the Mars yard, uh, the mission control center, which I don't have photographs of, but we are uh, now actually working on that. We have the, the building um, occupied. We have a 1200 square foot building for our mission control center. And uh, we're hoping for our first teams to arrive in May of 2022. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And I wanna take you just briefly through the first hermetic seal of Sam, which was the conclusion and the joy of our, uh, of our first uh, stage of, of, of reconstruction and refurbishing. And so basically we had five people inside for four hours and we had a small uh, pressure array or a sensor array, including barometric pressure, carbon dioxide, oxygen temperature, and relative humidity. And this was the timeline from uh, 802 to four, uh, I'm sorry, from 402 to 802. And we had just a few plants inside. You'll recognize these as being some edible leafy greens. And this was more for show. They weren't large enough to actually conduct any CO2 sequestration. We had a board game um, called uh, Extronaut that was developed for the, by the principal investigator for the um, OSIRIS-REx mission. We had our NASA approved Doritos and we had a robotic farming implement that we assembled uh, in those four hours. So this is, I climbed up in the space frame. This is our crew. Uh, which is myself and Trent and Katie and John from uh, University of Arizona, and then Jessica as a reporter from Harper's Magazine, and the article about her experience comes out in January in Harper's. So we're very proud of this. Um, so as I said, we monitored a number of, uh, of variables, and we, um, I won't go into all the details of this, but we were very successful in, in capturing that data, in showing the pressure increase, um, in showing the CO2, increase and then also the function of the CO2 scrubber and all of this data and the write-ups if you're interested are available on the SAM website which I will give you at the end. Uh, we also um, the oxygen levels uh, which which behaved as expected there's really no change in the oxygen because it's such a large volume you have to be in there for a long time to actually see the oxygen reduce. And of course, temperature and relative humidity, which must be tested in order to calibrate continually calibrate the CO2 sensor. So back to the lung, and this is really, really cool. This is the lung, in, this is the south lung at Biosphere 2. This is 40,000 pounds of steel and concrete floating on a cushion of air. And this is, this is artificially lifted by a, a blower or a pump on the outside of the interstitial space. Um, and it's, it's a five horsepower motor that can lift this. Um, and this is how the Biospherians maintain a positive internal pressure for two years. They inflated two of these lungs that act as a baffle, or as a buffer, I should say, and also maintain a constant positive internal pressure of about one half PSI over ambient, in, 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 uh, independent of the number of barometric pressure changes or temperature changes outside through the seasons in Arizona. And we have, as I showed you before, a miniature version of this operating in SAM. So these are slides, these are photographs that were just taken uh, two weeks ago. So I just wanna give you a quick update. Um, I added these as we were uh, entering the, uh, the meeting tonight. And so we raised our lung, uh, I put on a, a respirator and pressure washed it. And this was nasty in here. I won't show you the details of how bad it was before, but you can imagine 30 years of the desert living in here because somebody forgot to shut the door um, for the last 25, 30 years. So we lifted it up, we power washed it and sanded it and then scrubbed it and then we primed it. And uh, this is my partner, Colleen, um, who came to help paint it. 
And so we put in a nice coat of enamel and it looks brand new. So this has been a lot of my joy is taking this old, these old buildings and refurbishing them to something beautiful and usable again. Um, those stilts of course come off um, after we're done with the process and, uh, and then we'll be able to fly them along. And this is how we pressurize our vessel for the visiting teams. So well, I won't go into details here. This is a fun slide, but I think I'm a little bit over time here. So we were able to calculate the mass of the lung by simply looking at the, um, the cubic feet and the amount of pressure increase that we measured during that four hour seal. Um, and we were able to calculate the, uh, sorry, I had the numbers wrong. It was 3,800 pounds, 1,700 kilograms, but we were able to calculate that. And then we went back to the original architect and engineer who built the biosphere and this test, and test model, and they said that we were, we were spot on. That was kind of cool. Some basic math that actually that really worked. So in conclusion, um, I, I know that going to Mars is exciting and, and, and of human space travel is terribly exciting, but really for me, there, there's a second and maybe even a prominent reason why I'm involved in this. And this is the only thing I'll read to you from the slides. Um, we, we want to engage research teams from around the world in hands-on scientific discovery, and we want to inspire the next generation to be engaged custodians of this planet while we're exploring new worlds. And that really says a lot for me because when you, when you move into a habitat as small as this, whether it's one person, two people, three people, four people, you're gonna be living a very different life than you do in your home. It's all vegetarian diet, all your food is freeze dried, all of your water is recycled. You're limited on the chemical. There's no chemicals. You can't bring any chemicals in. Your shampoo, your body soap, everything will be dictated uh, or at least reviewed as they do with NASA on the space station because there is no throwing it away. There is no place to put things outside of the vessel. And so it really changes each team member's awareness of their environment, of their interaction with the environment. And as all the biospherians have told me in, in recent conversations, they all became intimately aware of how the plants inside the biosphere were directly related to their every breath that they took. And I think that's something that we've obviously forgotten about from the industrial revolution forward. And we're in a crisis today because we forgot that. And so I really am excited about this project, not only because we're preparing to become interplanetary, but because we're reminded on an intimate basis how important it is that we are connected to the world around us and that we are part of a system, part of an ecosystem. And there really is no throwing it away, despite the fact the planet is much larger than, than what we might have in here. So um, as I said, team registration is open for 2022. Um, thank you to all the people we've worked with, Nat Geo and Paragon and uh, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Biosphere 2, NASA. Uh, we have a lot of support from NASA and here's our website. And uh, that is the, the end of my, my talk. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Okay. Um, I don't have any questions at present, but I wonder, you know, if people may have some and just have not entered them into the chat yet. So um, if you do have a question, if you would enter that into the chat, that would be great. I see one here. Okay. Uh, I see one that says, have there been any plant diseases? So let me, let me switch back over here. Have there been any plant diseases in biosphere? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in the biosphere too, there, it, it's, it's an open research center now. It's not sealed anymore. So there is an exchange of air with the outside. There are birds and sometimes there's occasional rattlesnakes that'll come in and such. Um, of the original, I forget how many, it was over 200 plant species, for instance, that were brought into the rainforest. And if I remember correctly, about 65, don't quote me on these numbers, but something like 65 of, of the, no, sorry. I, could, I might have it backwards. I think like 35% of those species died off in the first year of being in the biosphere, but that was intentional. They, what they called a species packed, the, the rainforest and the entire biosphere. They, they put in as many different species as possible to see which ones made it and which ones didn't. And so the plants that remain in the biosphere today, most of them were planted by the biospherians 30, 30 odd years ago. And so that's a commendable experiment and success. As for diseases, I'm not aware of any, but that's a good question. If you send me an email, um, I'll be happy to ask Jason, who's in charge of the plant ecology in the, uh, in, the, in the biosphere, and we can see if there are any diseases that have sprung up since then. Let's see. 
Is the greenhouse with the analog Mars part of the ceiling? Okay, yes. So the greenhouse is, is the test module. The greenhouse um, is part of the experiment. It's part of the pressure vessel. And so people who come to our research uh, project or research platform to SAM will have access to both the crew quarters and they'll be able to walk right into the test module. Um, in fact, starting next week, we're going to start cutting open the side of the test module and expanding that, that pressure vessel to include the shipping container. So there'll be one large hermetic seal. Yeah, that's absolutely imperative for psychology and also for food production. Let's see, would they, would they use the biodome of Mars or on the moon? Um, okay, so you're talking about when you say biodome, um, if you can clarify, do you mean um, any kind of greenhouse structure or do you mean just the, the, the physical structure of a dome independent of what's inside? That's from Facebook, uh, Kai, so I'm oh. a little bit to get an answer. Okay, I'll answer both. Um, okay. So I think that as, as we move to the moon and Mars, we're gonna, there's going to be generations of, of endeavors, right? So the very first generation will be very similar to the Apollo mission. A capsule lands and they spend a few days on the moon. And now on Mars, you don't have that option. If you go to Mars, you're there for two years, no matter what. Um, but we, we anticipate that the first endeavors on Mars will probably not include a great deal of, of greenhouse space. It's just too expensive to, to send there on that first mission. That'll be built over time. As for dome structures, there's debate about this. So there are cloth, multi-layered cloth fabrics or fabrics I should say that have interweaving components of metals and plastics and cloth that do stop a good bit of lighter radiation. They can stop the alpha rays, the, the, the beta, even some of the higher energy x-rays and gamma rays, but they can't stop the, um, the cosmic rays, those high speed uh, particles, the subatomic particles that are moving at relativistic speeds. So there's debate about whether or not it will be safe to be in a dome on top of the surface on the moon or Mars, or we do have to in fact be underground in lava tubes or at least bury those domes with uh, regolith. And so I haven't found you know, a, 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 an answer that says we're definitely gonna do it this way or this way. And I think we're there are people who are continually advancing those fabrics and those dome structures uh, to protect us. Hopefully that answers both those questions, let's see. Uh, we change. Oh yeah, great question. Great, great question. Okay, so as we increase, as we increase the volume of living space, how will that lung respond? And that's a really good question. So the lung will still be able to pressurize the space, but it will have a reduced capacity to compensate based on the barometric and temperature changes. So because we have a larger volume of air, that means that as the air expands or contracts internally in response to temperature changes the lung might bottom out or maximize. And so in addition to the lung, we've also already have a prototype running of an automatic pressure regulation system based on a, uh, an air compressor, mechanical air compressor, a storage unit. And instead of the air compressor drawing air from the outside, it draws air from the inside. And so it's able to draw air from the inside, store it, and then put it back out again on the as-need basis. The entire thing runs off of Raspberry Pi, and uh, a very clever U of A engineering capstone team built that for us last year. I actually completed it uh, earlier this year. So we'll be enlarging that, so we'll have both the lung and a mechanical system that'll work um, in combination. Great question. Any other questions? Um, yes, I asked how long would it actually take to move enough items to another planet for a small crew to be able to survive long term? How long would it take? Okay, I think it's, it's not so much about time as it is about volume. So with the SpaceX uh, rockets getting larger and larger, and you know, they have some very, very, heavy, some really substantial heavy lift vehicles now. <clears throat> we, I don't know exactly how many rockets it would take to deliver, but we know it's more than one. I, I, at least the numbers I've seen is somewhere between three and five of the, uh, the Falcon heavies, if I remember the, the term correctly, to deliver everything that's needed for a two year stay. Um, I, I may be off by one rocket or so, but it's, it's not a single rocket venture from everything I've read, it's multiple rockets. So it's not so much about time as it is about the number of rockets. And then of course, it's about a seven month journey to Mars. Um, from here. Ray asks, um, as crew quarters are added, 
air volume will change. How does that impact the function of the lung? That's the one I answered prior, but thank you, May. Yeah, we answered. Okay, sorry. Before. Yeah, it's okay. Um, one, I think mm -hmm. that's all that I see. Does somebody else have a question that you want to add? Here's or one more. Here's one more question, and then I'll, I'll offer a little bit more information. It says, will the soil inside of SAM be a realistic representation of the soil marsh? Great question. Oh, you guys are good. Um, so we are going to be doing principally hydroponics, but we will have a soil-based test environment. And within that test environment, we will also include synthetic regolith. If you know anything about Mars, it has a lot of perchlorates, which is kind of a nasty chemical uh, that's not good to breathe, don't want to drink it, and it's probably going to kill most of our plants. So there are endeavors all over the world. There's a university in Korea. I know there's a number in the United States that are working on both chemical, mechanical, and biological means of removing those perchlorates. And we're hoping to bring one of those research teams to SAM so we can build synthetic regolith that represents what's on Mars and then try to turn it into something fertile which starts with removing those perchlorates and then breaking that raw rock down. So the best representation we have is again, Northern Arizona, uh, crushed basalt. Basalt is a rather, if I use the term correctly, inorganic material in the sense that it doesn't have readily available nutrients. You need responders, first responders like ferns to go in and break that rock down to make that available or mycelia. So there's gonna be a multi-layered effort to take that raw material and make it nutrient available for our food cultivars. Let's see. And then we have one that was missed from Heidi, um, which is, I'm not clear about the function of the lung. Will it be used on Mars? Okay. So the lung is a basically an air storage system that has a gravity fed pressure, pressure regulation. So if you didn't have the lung, if you just sealed up a glass building, and let's say you had a cold front move over Arizona, or when the sun rises and heats up that building and subsequently heats up the air inside, your windows would blow out. Your windows would just blow out or they would blow in depending upon if it's a high pressure or low pressure front. You have to have some way of compensating for the expanding air inside of the pressure vessel so we don't blow out the windows. The lung is like a drum head. It floats up and down, up and down. And as it floats, it will compensate for that change in atmosphere inside the temperature and the subsequent volume inside of the, of the of SAM. Now, would you have one on Mars? You could. The atmosphere there is very, very thin. So I don't think pressure rate, I don't think barometric pressure will have a big effect. It probably is not the most cost effective means. You're probably going to see storage of air in a compressed system instead, which is what I described as our, as our backup. Um, and one of the things I wanted to, um, to mention is that this research vessel, our, our whole platform is open to everyone in the world. You guys can put together a team of two, three or four people and present your mission objectives, your research objectives and come and use the facility. It's available to students, to professionals um, and to amateurs as well. And as long as your science is good and we'll help you define that, you can enter our, our vessel and use it. Um, Let's see, will the carbon that builds up from the CO2 scrubber be sent to the greenhouse? If not, yes, very good question. Thank you, Kay. Um, we do have a CO2 scrubber operating there now, present, uh, provided by Paragon, and uh, we'll be creating a new one. The CO2 scrubber will capture the CO2 and send uh, the CO2, that'll be in the human side, and it'll send the CO2 to the greenhouse side, and in the greenhouse side, we'll have an oxygen concentrator that captures the oxygen and sends it back over to the human side, to the crew quarters. Even though that, vessel is a continuous vessel, we'll have just a basic door between them, not a proper airlock, but just enough of a door to maintain general separation of temperature, humidity, and CO2 levels, not unlike walking into a greenhouse that might be attached to your house. Um, we don't need a solid airlock, we just need a basic division that keeps the air from moving back and forth readily. Hey, and this I, is part uh, of the experiment. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, from Facebook, uh, Wendy asks, so you will be able to grow and consume crops on Mars? That, that is the hope, absolutely. And that, I mean, that's, that, that's absolutely the hope. We are, we're certainly hoping that in the future, uh, and we believe that the technology is there today to be able to grow crops on and food cultivars on Mars. That's, it's out there. It's not the first or second generation habitats, um, but there's so much work being done today um, around the world to, to pre be prepared for that. These are great questions, thank you. You guys are good. Looks like there's one more in the chat. If you have a massive plant die off, will this affect the carbon disposal? Or did you answer that one? Uh, 
Absolutely. Good question. So one of the fundamental tenets, in fact, I realized in this presentation, I didn't show you our science tenets. Um, we, as our research team, core to SAM, have our own scientific objectives that are in parallel or in addition to the research teams that comes through. Our number one science objective is demonstrating the transition from a what's called physiochemical or mechanical CO2 scrubber, similar to what's on the space station, into bioregeneration, which is plant-based life support. And so that transition has never been demonstrated. Nobody's ever made that transition. Um, and so to answer your question, if we move, if we transition from mechanical CO2 scrubbers to plant-based CO2 sequestration and oxygen production, and we have a plant die off, then the system will automatically revert back to the mechanical system and the mechanical system will kick back in for as many weeks or months as required to get the plants growing again. And that's part of the experiment. We may even intentionally kill off the plants just to see if the system works. We have another question from Charles um, who says, is there a timeline for having a Mars colony completely independent of Earth that is a comet or asteroid strike would not wipe out all of humankind? Let's see, I, I don't think there's, I mean, there's no real fixed date. We know that SpaceX and NASA have their own agendas and their own timelines. NASA, of course, is longer. They're looking at the mid 30s, 2030s for the first humans on Mars. SpaceX is hoping to do it sooner. Um, but in terms of sending enough humans to Mars to actually propagate our species, uh, that's that's a, probably a long ways out. Um, you can look at the you can look at the uh, the numbers. You can play the numbers of how much DNA variation is required to propagate a species successfully. Some people say twelve. Some people say twelve thousand. Some people say a million. Depends on who you talk to. Um, but so that's not really a definitive. There's no definitive number in that. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's gonna happen as fast as it is possible and financially feasible. I think the finances are truly the number one gap. Um, there's, there's plenty of money on the planet, but it's not being devoted. <laughs> it's not being devoted to, to going to Mars right now. So I think everyone's still scraping to get that, that put together. Kai, another question from Facebook. Uh, Lynn asks, how does the system produce and store water? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so we have a water inlet that was in there from, from the original days of use, and we will limit the amount of water coming in, uh, and then we'll turn the tap off. And so we will have water uh, purification systems, and that'll be everything from, we will not be using reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is terribly wasteful. Uh, we'll be using bio, uh, bio membranes. We'll be using uh, activated carbon and various levels of physical and chemical, or I should say physical and biological filters. And the goal, I should clarify that, when the teams enter, each research team will be able to kind of dial in or dial down how much of a seal they want. They can choose to have a pass-through environment where we pass air through on a regular basis, but we monitor the quantity of the air. And there's then you can dial it all the way into fully sealed. The fully sealed environment is much, much harder and will take a team that's ready for that challenge. In that case, uh, that will also include full water uh, capture and recycling. But the goal, of course, is to use the water in each stage. So drinking water, um, I should say, uh, like dish water will become plant water you would water the plants with. And then after it's gone through the plants, you'll be able to use that water one more time. We know how, technically, we know how to recycle human urine and feces. But the biggest hurdle is not the technology, it's the, it's the, uh, the county. Uh, and their laws, so uh, their rules. So it may be some time before we convince the county. Um, uh, is it not Cochise? It's, um, oh shoot, I forget which county Biosphere 2 is in in Oracle. Anyway, what, Pinal, when we, pardon me? Is it in Pinal? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, in Pinal County. So when we convince Pinal County that we can do this safely, that's when we'll get our, our full recycling systems in place and composting. So that, and we're not, we'll go after that a year or two from now after we have everything else running. Sometimes the legal challenges are greater than the financial or technical challenges. Let's see, um, where will you send the human poop? Yes, okay, so a vision, yeah, Matt Damon and, and, his, uh, and his potato poop or poop, poop potatoes. Um, unfortunately, that's not realistic for a number of reasons, but we won't, we won't go into that. For initially, we'll be capturing the poop much as if you're going down the Colorado River in what are called blue bags. There are these, uh, these nice disposable bags. We'll be pooping in bags. And, uh, and we will be carrying them out at the end of each mission. 
And that's initially, like I said, ultimately we wanna do have a full waste recycling system, but we need to convince the county that it's safe and get all the regulations and red tape and stuff in place. Um, why is Mars a better target for occupation rather than the moon? Atmosphere, gravity, temperature. Okay, so Mars, the moon has, uh, the regolith on the moon is very sharp. It has, you know, there's no wind, there's no water. Um, every fragment of dust on the moon is just dangerous. It, you, you can't breathe it, you don't want to touch it. It doesn't mean we won't live there. It just means that it's, it's really quite a challenge. And because the moon has no atmosphere, it's the radiation on the moon is much higher than what it will be on Mars. Mars atmosphere is thin, but it still does provide some uh, radiation protection, especially if you were down in, for instance, in Valles Marineris, where you're even deeper down. So the, also the readily available uh, minerals and, and different types of stone and such on Mars, we believe will provide um, a greater uh, a diversity of building materials. And the amount of water on, the, on Mars is prevalent everywhere. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's, about, there's enough water trapped in the soil and on the, or in the regolith and on the caps, the polar caps, to cover the planet in a meter of water. There's water on the moon, but it's only on the poles, uh, a little bit more difficult to get to. So each one of them has their benefits and their drawbacks. I think Mars is probably more interesting uh, for large scale occupation, um, if we use that word, um, simply because it has more going for it and it's probably closer to what we're comfortable with here on Earth. Jim, do you have any more questions from Facebook? No, nothing else from Facebook. Okay, I don't think we have anything that has not been asked in the regular um, list. So. This has been great. I really appreciate the interaction. You, you guys are fantastic. This is probably the most questions I've had in the last 22 presentations uh, this year. So I, I, it's a great way to, to end my, my year. I'm not taking any more presentations this year. So this is the last one and you guys are the best. So thank you. So, well, and we got a couple of comments that this was a cool presentation and thank you. So um, we really appreciate your coming and sharing all this information with us. We hope that you will update us at some point about progress being made. Well, even better, even better. When you guys are comfortable and ready, you are openly invited to come to Biosphere 2. We can arrange a private behind the scenes tour for everyone who comes up. We can cater the event and have dinner out in the patio if you want. We have, um, as, a, as a, num a number of members of your organization are there on a regular basis presenting the night sky to uh, visitors, but we now have a 36 inch optical telescope um, on the plateau up there. We have a 10 meter um, radio telescope. We've got five automated telescopes. We've got some really cool stuff. So why don't we arrange a time when you guys come for a tour of Biosphere 2, a tour of our Mars analog, and then we, tour the night sky for a couple of hours and have some pizza and drink some beer and enjoy a, enjoy an evening out outside. That would be the best way for the update. Sounds like a really fun thing to do, Kai. Yeah. The, the 36 inch telescope was just installed recently by Vishnu and Roberto, two fantastic professors at U of A, and they love hosting people. So it, it's a gorgeous telescope. It's a Dobsonian mount uh, with fully automated controls built by a gentleman down floor. And it's, it's gorgeous. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation as well. You're welcome. You're welcome. Please follow through. I'd love to see you there. So we'll, we'll just stay in touch here. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone. This has right. been really enjoyable. Okay, All right. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I have uh, one announcement. And um, that is that <clears throat> Doug Smith, has um, just finished his sketching observing program award from the Astronomical League. And Doug, I need for you to tell us if you can give us a paragraph or so about what is the sketching observing program? What does that involve? Okay. What kinds of things do you sketch? Um, so the, the sketching observing program is you go out and sketch um, 75 different objects, and it's the whole range of objects. It, uh, there's a list 
that you choose from. Uh, the list is a lot more than 75, but you only have to do 75. Um, and it's all different kinds of objects. You're, you're sketching double stars, globular clusters, galaxies, planets, the moon, a comet. It's the whole, it's the whole alphabet from A to Z. So um, yeah, it's, it, that was a nice program to do. It was, you're not allowed to use sketches. You, you can use a, a small number of sketches that you did on other observing programs, but basically you have to do them all again. And the, the coordinator, the program coordinator, and forgive me, I can't remember his name. Uh, he wants you to try different techniques too, not just pencil sketches, but uh, pastels, watercolors, colored pencils. He wants you to experiment with different techniques also. Um, so it, it was a very fun program. It, it took me eight months to do it because um, the objects are scattered all over the sky. Um, and um, the program has been around a long time and I was surprised that I'm, my certificate number is only 51. So not many people have done it. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for telling us about it. Um, and, um, and we hope that different people are trying different astronomical league programs. Those are always there, so interesting to pursue. There are a few people working on different programs. Right. Okay. And next we have a poem from David Levy. David, you're on mute right now. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, May. And Kai, that was a good lecture. I enjoyed it. Wendy and I enjoyed it very much. I've known Kai. Wendy and I have known Kai for many years now. And um, <clears throat> except please don't refer to us as you guys because you're part of us. You're part of the club. And we hope you'll be at many more of our meetings. My poetic quotation tonight is from Milton in anticipation of the Geminid meteors. And uh, right before the Geminids, I hope we're all enjoying uh, the comet that's in the sky, Comet Leonard. I've seen it now on three nights, and it's been, it's really quite a joy to look at. Anyway, here's my quote from Milton. It's a blend of two parts of Paradise Lost. Him the almighty power hold headlong flaming from the ethereal sky. The imperial ensign, which full high advanced, shone like a meteor streaming into the wind with gems and golden luster, rich and blazed, seraphic arms and trophies shone like a meteor streaming to the wind. Thank you, May, back to you. Okay, thanks, David. Um, okay, we are now going to say uh, goodbye for this evening to our Facebook people. And um, we hope that they enjoy being with us and that they will come back again next month and visit our website. Um, and you'll notice on the website, there's, a, there's an invitation to join and there's also a donate button. So um, we love for you to participate in our website in any way that, that you wish to do. Um, so um, we will now move from this to, I think Terry Lappin has now joined us and Terry and Jim are going to work on breakout rooms. Kay had a question she wanted to ask me. Oh, okay. Hi, yes, um, this is Carol Bott in New York. I just, I go by Kay on Zoom. Oh. But, um, hey, Doug. Hi. So um, when on that list that you completed, does it have to include, you know, four different types of lists? Like, you know, um, you could do Messier objects, um, NGC, so many galaxies, or anything you want. Could it be all globular clusters or something like no, that? No, no. The list, the list. Uh, I think the the list that he gives you to work with is like a hundred objects. Okay. All, all different kinds of objects, and you have to pick seventy five of them. So you you're going to get a uh, a wide plethora because there's only like 12 globulars and maybe 10 galaxies and yeah. a bunch of open clusters and some nebulas and so if you pick 75 you're going to have a whole plethora across the whole spectrum okay got it thank you okay great
Thanks. Okay, Jim, um, are you handling Facebook or I mean the the division into breakout rooms or is Terry handling that? No, I will do that. 